I direct your attention to the book of 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1, we're going to begin reading with verse number 5. To all of our guests, we are thankful you are here. And uh, we trust that God will meet you tonight. We want to invite you back. We have service tomorrow night in our Spanish uh, service. And then Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Sunday afternoon, again, the Spanish service at 1.30 p.m. And then Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have a great time in the Holy Ghost. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 1. We're going to begin reading with verse number 5. As you know, your Old Testament, as divided, has 39 books. The Jewish Bible, if you will, uh, has the same exact books, but they're divided differently. They have 22 books. And for instance, the, the 12 minor prophets are all gathered together in one. And... The books of uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, are grouped together, and it, it is um, it makes sense because the passage that we're reading in First Kings is simply a continuation of Second Samuel. It is the last days of David, the greatest I would say king that Israel ever had. It is the last days of King David. He is old. He is, as the Bible says, stricken in years. He is about to die. And uh, it is in this setting that we read about one of his sons by the name of Adonijah. Verse number five, the Bible says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him and his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? That just means his dad had never got unto him and said, what in the world are you doing? Can I tell you that children need dads that say, what in the world are you doing? The Bible says that he also was a goodly man. He was good looking. Not only was he spoiled, he was good looking. And his mother bare him after Absalom. This was what a pair Absalom and then Adonijah. Notice in verse 7, this is important for what we will be talking about tonight. He conferred, that is, Adonijah conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest. And they, following Adonijah, helped him. The Bible says in verse 8, But Zadok, the priest, and Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shimei, and Rai and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. These mighty men, I'm assuming, I know it's David's bodyguard, I'm assuming it's talking about those mighty men. Such a fascinating chapter in 2 Samuel 23. They did not go with Adonijah. Verse 9 says that Adonijah prepares a feast. He calls his brethren, the king's sons, And all the men of Judah, the king's servants. Verse 10. But Nathan the prophet and Benaiah and the mighty men and Solomon his brother, he called not. Now I know you're standing, but I do want to read four more verses. Skipping up, same chapter, to verse number 24. This insurrection, this this betrayal of King David and his eventual successor Solomon was found out by Nathan the prophet. And uh, Nathan had went to Bathsheba and kind of talked to her, hey, here's our stratagem. This is what we're going to do, how we're going to approach David and tell him what Adonijah is doing. And so he goes in first in verse number 24 and says, my Lord, O king, this is Nathan talking. My Lord, O king, he's talking to David. Hast thou said... Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. For he has gone down this day, and hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the king's sons and the captains of the hosts, and Abiathar the priest. And behold, they eat and drink before him and say, God save Adonijah. But me, he's talking about himself. Nathan is saying, even me thy servant. And Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called? David, is this thing done by 
my lord the king and thou hast not showed it unto thy servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him amen why don't we pray together and let's ask that the lord would talk to our hearts and talk to our spirits talk to us in this place tonight would you help me pray amen let's ask that god would be with us right now lord jesus we love you God, we thank you that we're gathered together in your sanctuary on this Wednesday night. God, we're asking that the Word and the Spirit would come together, that you would talk to us, that you would speak to us, that, oh, God, the heavens would open, and, God, the Spirit of Revelation would come in this place. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Why don't we thank the Lord before we're seated? Come on, thank him together. Lord, we love you. Bless you. Amen, amen, and God bless you. You can be seated in Jesus' name. It is sad to say, but certainly true, that I, as well as everybody under the sound of my voice, uh, we are all capable of of failure and of doing things that that I think would would blow our minds if we allowed our base nature to have its way. I know that's quite an introductory statement for a message, but it's important for us to know that that human nature if allowed to do what it wants, allowed to go where it wants, allowed to uh, speak however it wants to speak, that human nature is capable of great failure. And it's capable, as we read in this text tonight, of great uh, treachery and uh, even betrayal. And before we get into the text of 1 Kings 1, I want to give an example that springs to mind whenever we talk about the word betrayal. And if you know your Bible, probably the first name that jumps out from Scripture is the name of a man that has went down in infamy by the name of Judas. And Judas has went down, uh, as I said, in infamy, but it wasn't supposed to be that way. I personally, I do not believe that Jesus chose Judas with the express purpose of him betraying himself. I, I do know that there, and that, that's quite a, quite, a, quite a conversation, because I do know, as you do, that there's plenty of prophecy that there would be one that would betray the Lord. I, uh, Psalm 55 and 12, where it talks about uh, we took sweet counsel together, and we walked together in company. And it says, I, I, if it had been an enemy, I could have borne it. But it was thou, a friend, mine equal, that, that essentially betrayed me. I know of Psalm 109 and Psalm 69 that talk about that a, a, uh, his bishopric will another take. Somebody will take his, his place in those two scriptures. And I know Judas fulfilled all of them, but I don't believe that Judas had to because if you believe that, you believe in predestination. Now, I do believe somebody was going to, but Judas appropriated those frightening, terrifying Old Testament prophecies to himself by his own decisions. And I'll just stop and say this. This is not my message tonight, but brothers and sisters, we all have a choice on what we're going to do with our life. There are prophecies that will fit your life, whatever you do. At the end of your life, you will have fulfilled the word of God because the word of God is true. It is forever settled in heaven. It cannot lie. And it is specific to everybody under the sound of my voice. And so we have a choice that the word of God will either be to us for cursing or it will be to us for blessing. Am I talking to somebody tonight that would say, I want God's word to be in my life for blessing. When, I, when they do my funeral, I want them to be able to say, hey, 
The blessings of the Lord were upon his life and family. Anybody interested in ending your life that way? Amen. But, but, but Judas let those scriptures, those negative prophecies, apply to his life by his decisions. And again, Judas's life was not supposed to end that way, in my opinion. His life was supposed to end good. In fact, the name Judas means praise. Somebody say praise. What a beautiful name. It's the equivalent of the Old Testament name Judah. And he was perhaps one of the most capable of the 12 disciples. We understand that Jesus tasked him with the job of being the one that carried the bag. That means he was the treasurer for the 12 disciples. Can I tell you, you don't pick just anybody to do that job. Thank God we got an awesome church secretary, Sister Nancy Longo. (laughs) Hallelujah. And you don't just pick anybody to do that. Amen. And I mean that we are blessed. Judas was picked. I think he had special gifting, special abilities. But somewhere in his life, he got twisted up and, and, and messed up. And I, I, I can't help but wonder that one of the key contributing factors to Judas's betrayal is the fact. I want you to notice there was a point uh, in the book of John chapter 13 and both of the, or excuse me, all three of the synoptic gospels recorded as well where Jesus essentially speaks to Judas and he says, if you're going to betray me, you need to hurry up and do what you're going to do. Judas leaps to his feet and flees the room. And it's from that point that he begins the process of betrayal. But I, I'll just tell you tonight, I believe that Judas made a major mistake when he got up in that moment. Amen. I think he should have repented and he should have stayed at that table He should have fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Jesus, forgive me. I don't know what's going on in my brain. I'm I'm just here to tell you, I don't care what you are contemplating. I don't care what sin is in your life. I don't care what mistakes have happened in your life. We still serve a God that is able to make you clean and set you free. And brothers and sisters, the answer is not to run out of the room. The answer is to run to the altar. The answer is to run to the feet of Jesus. The answer is to get to the cross. Anybody thankful for a God that knows how to forgive our sins? Amen. But Judas left. He left Jesus' presence, and he left the presence of the disciples. That was a major mistake. I want to tell you tonight, if you want to be all right, one of the best things you can do is stay close to Jesus and stay close to the church. When you leave the presence of the Lord... And when you leave people, amen, it's not a good thing. In fact, I'll just tell you, isolation leads to weirdness. It leads to distortion of thinking. I heard somebody say it's, it's, it, you get the kind of thinking that, that where you hear hoof clops and you think zebra instead of thinking horse. You just, you're not thinking straight. That's what happens when you're all by yourself. I, I, I want to talk to us tonight about the value of protecting yourself by surrounding yourself with good people. I want to warn against the danger of separating yourself from people that God has placed in your life in order to keep you on the straight and narrow, to keep you from thinking thoughts that you never want to think, from keeping you from from doing things that you never want to do. I tell you tonight, I'm thankful for friends and brothers and sisters in the church. I'm thankful for the saints of God, hallelujah, that are in this house tonight. I've been thankful all day long that I got to come back to church and feel the presence of the Lord, but I'm also glad to be in the house of God with you in this place tonight. Amen. I'll just tell you, being in this house tonight helps me think right. It helps me do right. It It's what my dad says, church is where you go to get your head on straight. Amen. How many know that the world can get you thinking goofy? Amen. The news can get you thinking goofy. Coworkers can get you thinking goofy. And a bad boss can really affect your thinking. But I'm here to tell you, you get to the house of God. Get in the presence of the Lord. Let the word go forth. Hallelujah. Let the Holy Ghost begin to move. And get with your brothers and sisters. And it can protect you from making bad mistakes in your life. I'm thankful for brothers and sisters in this house tonight. Amen. Somebody defined a friend. They said a true friend is somebody 
that brings out the best in you. I need people like that around me. I need people that help me to protect myself from myself. I'm just telling you, every one of us have that Judas tendency. We have that Judas uh, ability that we can end up where Judas ended up at. Amen. We don't ever need to get to the point that we are above that. I want to surround myself by good people. And that's what we read in our text tonight. And without getting too far ahead of ourselves, this is another betrayal of King David. This is Adonijah that is going to betray David. David's not even dead yet. And uh, he's weak and in bed. We'll talk about that in a moment. And, uh, but it's, it's clear that Adonijah thought about how he was going to go about this betrayal. Brother Pierce, he said, there's some people I want around me when I betray the king. I'm safe if I have Joab. I'll be all right if I, if I have Abiathar. But I better keep Nathan and Zadok and, and, and Benaiah and Solomon away because they're going to mess me up. If I want to sin, I don't want to have those preachers around me. I'm here to tell you, it matters who you surround yourself by. Anybody interested in making it all the way to heaven? I've come to give you a big help tonight, something that's going to help me and help you. Let's surround ourselves by the right people. Hallelujah. I want to be protected from myself. Uh, Hallelujah. I want true friends that will bring out the best in me. Can you say amen? And so, this Bible lesson tonight, I I, I thought about titling it Surrounded by the Right People. Or protecting yourself from yourself, or a true friend is someone that brings out the best in you. But what I'm going to go with tonight is from our text, at least the idea and theme of the story of our text. I want to just use this kind of as a hook to hang your hat on, a place to keep uh, the, the thought of this message in, and that is this. I want to preach, teach on this thought, people you don't want present when you betray the king. There are some people that you just don't want around if you're going to betray the king. Now, I want to talk tonight for a few minutes about Adonijah's betrayal of King David. First thing that I want you to notice, we already alluded to the fact, is that there was a specific timing when Adonijah rose up in this revolution against King David. He did this, the Bible says in verse number one, when King David was old. Somebody say old. He was stricken in years. And it was then that verse five says, everybody say then. David was old and stricken in years. Then Adonijah exalted himself saying, I will be king. He waited until David was old. He didn't, he, he, he didn't have the courage to do it when David was strong. He didn't have the courage to do it when David was in the saddle on the throne. He certainly, and again, I don't know all the timeline of how old Adonijah was and David was, but when David was in his prime, Adonijah, even though David didn't get on to him, brothers and sisters, he knew, I'm going to wait till my dad is about to keel over. I want him in the bed just a few hours left. He said, in his mind, I can imagine him thinking, David's too old to be king and my brother's too young. This is a good time for me to overthrow the kingdom. The king is weak. The king is powerless. And I'm going to just tell you, that's that's something that we need to be careful of. And that is that we need to keep our relationship with the king of kings, with Jesus. It needs to be fresh and alive. It needs to be strong, vibrant, and powerful. Amen. It is, it's in times of weakness, hallelujah, that, that we begin to think weird. Hallelujah. It's usually not in the middle of a, of a, of a 15-day fast or a 7-day fast or a 21-day fast. Now, trust me, you have weird thoughts when you're fasting. But, but, it's, but you usually don't think about backsliding on day number 11 of a 21-day fast. Amen. But, but when you haven't prayed... You get weak, and when you haven't read your Bible, you get weak, and when you haven't been faithful to the house of God, you get weak. I'm I'm here to tell you, we need to keep our relationship with King Jesus strong. Hallelujah. We don't need to view him as weak, as powerless. We need to see him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's in control. He's on the throne. 
Hallelujah. I don't want to be led by my own ambitions and desires. And sometimes when I'm weak, I begin to do that. Hallelujah. I want to encourage somebody tonight. Let's be in prayer. Let's be in the word. Get closer to Jesus than we've ever been in our lives. Oh, is there anybody that wants to know him? Anybody that feels like Moses when he said, show me your glory. Anybody feel like the apostle Paul when he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, anybody want to know Jesus tonight? I'm going to tell you it's important that we have a strong, vibrant relationship with him. It was, it was when King David was almost dead that Adonijah looks over and he says, uh, you know what, this is, this is the time that I can think I can pull this off. And he is led by his own ambitions his own desires in betrayal of the greatest king that Israel ever had. I want you to notice also, as we've mentioned already, and this is what we're going to be talking about tonight, is that Adonijah's betrayal of King David is marked by him deliberately including certain people and excluding others in his betrayal of King David. The first thing that I want to take a few minutes talking about is those that Adonijah included in his betrayal. The Bible is very clear to say that there were two people, two surprising people in my opinion, that Adonijah must have went and talked to and asked them, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I want to be on the throne. I want to be on the, on, the, on the king's throne. I intend to be king. And I want you on my side. The first of these two is a man by the name of Joab. Everyone say Joab. Joab, as you know, was the, the captain of the, the, the king's host. He was a man that was mighty. He was known for being powerful. And ironically, he is known for being faithful and a faithful adherent to King David. In fact, one of the things it says about Joab during this time is that he, he went after Adonijah even though he didn't go after Absalom. And uh, you have to ask yourself, Joab, what caused you to follow Adonijah? Joab, why were you a betrayer of King David with Adonijah? What was it? I, and I, I, don't, I don't really know what it was, but I know that there's some clues in Scripture. One of them that we do see in the life of Joab throughout his life is he is a man of unrestrained ambition. Of virtually everything you see about Joab is for his own advancement. Sometimes it's for the sake of the kingdom, but almost never is he doing things because of God. He's an ambitious man. And I, I just want to tell you tonight, we need to be wary of and careful of ambition when it comes to the kingdom of God. Vision is different. Desire is beautiful, but ambition is dangerous. Vision is wonderful. Desire and passion to be used of God is what God is looking for. But I'm telling you, an ambitious man that doesn't know how to restrain that when it comes to the kingdom of God, it almost always leads to failure. We look at the archetype of, of this is, is, is Satan himself. Amen. We know that Satan was ambitious, and it led to his failure. In Isaiah 14, we read where, in reference to Satan, to Lucifer, questions are asked. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And then it says, this is how. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I, listen to all the personal pronouns, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Satan said, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. This is unbridled, unrestrained ambition. 
I will be like the most high. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And yet the Bible says, thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Brothers and sisters, God is looking for people that are hungry to be used of him. Amen. If there's one, one fire that I can fan in this house tonight, that would be the desire to be used of God, the desire to be a servant of God, the desire to win souls to God, the desire in this house for people to be a worshiper and praise, oh, that I could somehow, God would give me words tonight to inspire this church, and this is a worshiping church, but oh, if I could inspire you to worship and pray and praise like we've never done before, I, I believe God wants that kind of passion and desire. But passion and desire and vision is different than ambition. Ambition leads to betrayal and failure. And I wonder if that's what a part of Joab's problem. Another clue that we see in the life of Joab is, is very likely he held in his heart some offense. He was offended at King David. We know where uh, this, 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 this old commander, this gray-headed soldier... A man probably had a grudge at David when David replaced him with Amasa. And we know he had a grudge against Amasa because the Bible says that Amasa, when he took Joab's place, David moved Joab out, put Amasa in his place. And the Bible says that Joab went up to Amasa one day, took him by the beard like he would kiss him. Hey, man, beware of a man that tries to kiss you, that has a dagger especially. He takes him by the beard and he... And he acts like he's going to kiss him, and he stabs him in the side under the fifth rib and kills him. Amen. He was offended. He was hurt. I'm going to tell you, be careful of people that are hurt. Don't surround yourself by offended people. Amen. I want you to hear me tonight. Don't, it, it's not a good thing to make best friends with people that are always offended. Oh, hallelujah. Be careful if your best friend is always griping and talking about how somebody did them wrong and somebody's talking about them. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, you need to be careful of that ambition and offense often go together. And before it was over, Joab had teamed up with Adonijah. Adonijah said, I am comfortable betraying the king with this man by my side. Amen. We see this, we see that ambition and offense often go together. Something that I've been noticing of late is one of the tribes of Israel by the name of Ephraim had a little, there's a little track record that you see floating through Ephraim. Now Ephraim was blessed. I talked about them, I guess, last Wednesday night. The, one of the sons of jo Joseph, they received that balanced blessing that we talked about. But Ephraim has this little track record. You, you read it uh, first in Joshua chapter 17. They go to uh, they go to Ephraim and Manasseh go to Joshua, and without going into detail, they essentially ask him for more land, more, more acreage, more property. They say, because we are great people. Well, the truth of the matter is they were. And so Joshua looks at them and he says, Well, if you're great, go get some more. And they said, Well, the, the, the place that you're talking about's got a lot of mean people there. There's enemies that, that might fight us. And he said, well, I thought you just said you were great. This is in Joshua 17. It's fun to read. And finally, he just looks him in the eye. Hey, if you're big and bad enough and good as you think you are, go get some more land. And so this kind of self-promoting Ephraim, you see this, this, this tendency in their life. And it next pops up that I noticed in the book of Judges chapter number eight with Gideon. The Bible says that, that Gideon had, had fought uh, as a judge uh, against the Midianites. God had used him powerfully. And Ephraim, after the victory, comes to, to Gideon, and, he, and they say to him, they're kind of offended. They're kind of, they're kind of uh, in a tizzy a little bit. They're throwing a hissy fit. They say, Gideon, why did you not call us to fight? I mean, they just won this great victory. But he's, he's saying, why didn't you use us? I, I don't know what you were thinking. I mean, I mean, we are gifted here. We would have killed that solo for the choir. What in the world are you thinking? Why did you not use me? And, and, and the Bible says that it moves on from there. And we read a few chapters later in Judge, uh, Judges chapter 12, the same thing happens with Jephthah. 
Jephthah wins a mighty battle. He gets done, and guess who comes knocking on the door? It's Ephraim, and Ephraim, the tribe, opens the door and says, why didn't you use us? I know you just had a mighty victory, but you should have used us. Don't you know how great we are? Why were we passed over? Why are you asking so-and-so to do this? Why are you using them to do this? Brothers and sisters, they had a track record of being offended. And before it's over, they begin to fight against Jephthah. They started a little civil war. I'm here to tell you, an offended, ambitious spirit is a dangerous spirit. A combination and brothers and sisters don't make that your best friend don't make that your best friend hallelujah I'm, I'm just here to tell you you don't want to have people around you that make it easy to betray Jesus you don't want to, to have people around you that make it easy to betray leadership. You don't want to make it easy by having people around you that, that, that allow you to give way to the base nature that we all have. Oh, that God would give us a spirit that says, surround me, God, by people that are pure and true, that people that cannot be offended, by people that love the word of God. Come on now, we need to surround ourselves. That's why the psalmist said in 11965, great peace. Somebody say great peace. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. I don't want friends that are always offended. I don't want friends that are always ambitious. Yes, I want hungry, passionate, desirous people that are pushing for the glory of God. But I don't want self-promotion. Oh, God, help us. Oh, God, change us. Oh, God, surround us by people that love your word and love your way. Let's lift our hands and let's pray together all across this place. Come on, let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Adonijah, Adonijah took Joab, another guy that he was comfortable bringing with him. is so surprising to me. Is a man by the name of Abiathar. Everyone say Abiathar. Abiathar was the high priest. We read this, that, that his defection here is, is absolutely staggering. It's surprising. It's, it must have been a knife thrust to the dying David's heart. It must have been painful to the youthful Solomon to hear that Abiathar, that he had heard about all his life, in his dad's latter years, is betraying and becoming a traitor. Now we got to wonder what, what caused this. We don't really know. We do know this, that Abiathar and Zadok were priests together, and it appears that, that Abiathar was the high priest and that Zadok was his assistant because in 1 Kings 2 and 35, it says that Zadok became priest in, uh, in Abiathar's place. And so, but as you read the scriptures through the life of David, they're always together, Abiathar and Zadok, Abiathar and Zadok. And, uh, and some have speculated, and I've wondered, if maybe what caused this betrayal by Abiathar is that he had gotten jealous of his friend, former friend by the name of Zadok. I don't really know, but I do know something got twisted up in his spirit. I've, I did notice this today as I was reading. There was a, an interesting passage in 2 Samuel 15 when, when David is talking to both Zadok and Abiathar. Now remember, Abiathar is the high priest, so he's his superior kind of. And, and Zadok is the assistant. The assistant. And, and David looks at the two and he talks to Zadok and he says, Now, he says, aren't you a seer? He's, apparently, Zadok was known as being a prophet of God, someone that the Holy Ghost would move on, like Samuel. He was a, a seer. He could see in the Spirit. And I, I just wonder if, if maybe there was something in Abiathar that became resentful of Zadok in that moment. He's more gifted. He's anointed in a different way. God is using him in ways that I'm not being used. I, I don't know if that happened, but I'm going to tell you, that is human nature, and we need to pray God, don't let me get jealous. God, I don't want to be envious. 
God, I want to have people in my life that are more gifted, that are more anointed. I want people that are more blessed. I don't want to be, and thank God it's easy for me, I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, the most intelligent guy in the room, the wisest man in the room. I want to be surrounded by spiritual giants that challenge me. I don't want to be envious. Come on, somebody needs to pray that God would give us a spirit that can be around others that are blessed. Amen. If a brother pulls in the parking lot with a new car, I want to rejoice with them. Hey, if a sister comes to church with a new dress, uh, I mean, more power to you, but I, if I was a sister, I want to be happy for you. Hallelujah. If somebody else comes to church and they've got a brand new baby, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I just want to say God bless you. Amen. And glad I've got four no more. But if somebody comes and they're blessed, I want to rejoice with them. I want to shout with them. If somebody gets the Holy Ghost, I want to shout with them. If somebody's kid gets the Holy Ghost, I want to shout with them. If I found out my brother gets promoted on the job and they got a raise, I'm going to go shake their hand, hug their neck, say praise God and thank you, Jesus. I don't want to be envious. I don't want to be jealous. I'm going to tell you that's a dangerous place to be. Don't surround yourself with envious people. Don't surround yourself with jealous people. Those are people that will allow you to betray the king. Let's lift our hands and let's pray together right now. Oh, let's pray in the spirit right now. Come on, lift your voice to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Amen, amen, amen. I want you to notice that Adonijah included Joab and Abiathar. But there were some others that the Bible very specifically says that he looked at them and he said, no, if I'm going to betray David, they can't be around me. They, I know them. They will keep me from being treacherous. They will prevent my base nature. They will prevent my unrestrained, unbridled ambition. Hey, I'm going to tell you, I want those kind of people around me. And so he excludes some people like Zadok and Nathan. Everybody say Zadok and Nathan. One was a priest and one was a prophet. I will tell you, I want priests and prophets in my life. These were anointed men. I want anointed people in my life. These were people that knew how to intercede. Hey, if you ever needed to get to the king, you went and talked to Nathan. Nathan knew how to walk into the throne room and look at the king and say, you're the man, you need to repent. And kings would put their crowns down, crawl off the throne, and weep and, for, weep and repent before Almighty God. Nathan knew how to go to the king while he's almost dead in his, in his deathbed and look at him and explain the Adonijah situation. I'm going to tell you, I want people that know how to pray that know how to intercede. I want anointed people all around. Come on, you want to make it living for God? Don't surround yourself with unprayerful people. Hallelujah. Don't find unanointed people. Don't find people that are ambitious, but find people that God has looked at and put his hand on them that know how to pray. God has poured his anointing on. I'm here to tell you, that'll prevent betrayal and treachery in your life. Amen, amen. I need people that are anointed. How many one anointed people in your life? I'm going to tell you, you can't have anointing without a priest and a prophet. Amen. And anointing flows from top down. I'm just telling you, listen to me, sir. You will not be anointed if you get out from under the authority that God has placed in your life. I'm telling you, it, ble it, it, it breeds shipwreck. It breeds destruction. It will bring and sows to the wind. Hallelujah. I'm here to help you and help your marriage and help your family stay under the flow of the anointing. The Bible says the anointing goes like this. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. It's saying that the anointing that was on Aaron's head went from the head to the feet. It goes from top to bottom. And I'm telling you, when you get out from under anointed apostolic authority, you have no anointing. 
Is that too hard? Then you need to reconsider your position. If you get out from under apostolic authority, you are out there all by yourself. It's a dangerous place to be. Betrayal and treachery can have its way. But bless your heart. I believe I'm preaching to a bunch of people tonight. We want Zadok. I want Nathan. Bring anointed people. Bring the praying people. I want people that know how to travail and intercede. Lift their voice to God. Come on, surround my children by anointed people. Let my marriage be surrounded by other anointed marriages. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, let's lift our hands and let's pray. Oh, let's lift our hands and let's pray. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It's a dangerous place when you become afraid of anointed people. Amen. Israel got to that place. Moses, cover up your face. You're shining with the glory of God. You're just too anointed. Cover up. Put a veil. And the Bible says that he put a veil on his face. And I'm here to tell you, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 that that veil is still on the Jews when they read Moses to this day. It's a scary place to be when you're afraid of the preacher, when you're afraid of the anointed word of God, when you're afraid of anointed authority, when you separate yourself from it, when you no longer want to share your desires. I'm going to tell you, it'll affect you. It'll affect your children. Don't be the weak link in your family. Come on, let's lift our hands and let's pray right now. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, I feel the Lord talking to us. Hallelujah. 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 But I'm here to tell you there was a Solomon that said, you don't want Nathan, I'll take him. You don't want Zadok, I'll take him. Hallelujah. He put Zadok in Abiathar's place. He said, I want to get as close to anointed people as I can. Oh, that some young people in this house tonight would get a desire that says, I want to be around anointed people. Come on, I'd love to see some of you young preachers start chasing preachers around. I don't mean in an ambitious way, but I mean in in prayer. God, let their anointing get on me. God, give me a double portion of their anointing. God, I want to serve. I'll pour water on their hands. Whatever i got to do, I've got to have the anointing on my life. Oh, that some young ladies would get a desperation for the anointing of God to be on you. Come on, young marrieds. Come on, elders. Hallelujah. How many are still hungry and desirous? that the prophetic, that the anointing, that the, the Holy Ghost, people that got it would be in your world. If you feel that way again, let's lift our hands. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. There was another class of people that Adonijah, when he was going to betray his old daddy, I'm listen, David was the, the, the real deal. David was a giant killer. David in his prime was so bad to the bone that God looked at him and said, David, I can't even let you build my house. Your hands are so bloody. Now, those, those, the blood that was on his hands was blood that God had told him to shed. But he was so bad to the bone, God said, mm, I think I better have your son build this house. I'm telling you, David was bad, and Adonijah knew, I better wait till he gets old. And if I'm going to betray that old man that's in a bed over there, there's another class of people I don't want around me, and that is called, that's the mighty men. Somebody say the mighty men. I don't want Benaiah around me. I don't want Shimei around me. I don't want Rei around me, and I don't want David's bodyguard. These guys won't let me betray the king. Amen. <laughs> Uh, and, and yes, we know he did bring Joab, who was a bad dude. But Joab was weak in his character. He was strong in body and physique and mind, but he was weak in integrity. I, I'm just here to warn somebody tonight. Don't surround yourself with weak people when it comes to integrity. When it comes to integrity. I don't want to surround myself with unfaithful people. I don't want to surround myself with unprayerful people. I don't want to hang around people that don't know how to be in the house of God, but I want to be around some Benias. Hey, there's some mighty men and women in this house tonight. If you're a new convert, I'm here to encourage you, find people that know how to pray. 
and hang around them. Find people that know how to come to God's house and talk to him and pray and hang around them. Find people that are there on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and say, that's the kind of people I want to hang around. Hey, I want to be around the Benaiahs. You want to know about Benaiah? The Bible says of Benaiah, he was the kind of, this is just some of his mighty acts that he did. The Bible says he slew two lion-like men of Moab. I don't even know what a lion-like man is. I just know that sounds pretty tough. That sounds weird. That sounds scary. Sounds kind of monstrous. It was a lion-like man. But the Bible says he, he took them on and he took them out. That's the kind of guy I want to be around. The Bible says he also went down and he slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. I don't even know what that means. But I think it's bad to the bone. I don't know if he killed the lion because he knew if there was enough snow. I've heard this preached. That the snow would fill the pit and the lion would get out. And so he said, I'm going to kill you now before you endanger somebody later. I don't know. I just like to be around mighty men. I don't know what that all means, but I want to protect myself by surrounding myself with men and women that can take care of monsters, that can handle wild beasts. I want people that have got their pride under control. I don't want to hang around people that let pride, the monster of pride in their life. I don't want to be around selfish people. I don't want to be around gossiping people. I don't got time to be around negative people. I don't want to be around lazy people. I don't want to be around fearful people. I want to be surrounded by mighty men and women that will take care of the wild beasts. Because if I get a benign in my life, that's going to help me in making sure I'm loyal to the king. And I want to live for God all the days of my life. Come on, somebody needs to make up in your mind. I want Daniels in my life that can go in a lion's den. I want three Hebrew children that can go in a fiery furnace. I want a Jonah that can get swallowed by a well, get his spirit right, and preach to Nineveh. Hallelujah. I want a David that can take out a Goliath. I'm not looking for dead, dry uh, people that are barely making it. Now, listen, you know I, wanna, I want everybody to make it. But if I'm going to make friends and close acquaintances, I've got to surround my Myself with mighty men and women that know how to live for God. Oh, is that how you feel tonight? Amen. I want people that have got some experience with lions. You know why Daniel could go in a lion's den? Amen. Because he had seen all kinds of visions of leopards and lions. Amen. This is the guy that had those, those dreams. The lion's den was nothing for him. I want to be with some men and women that have got some battles in their past. Hallelujah. They know how to fight till their hand uh, clave to the sword. I, I want some people that got some battle scars. Uh, hallelujah. You, you need to say, I'm going to hang around people that are going to prevent me from letting my base, uh, Judish, uh, uh, treacherous nature be a, uh, have its way in my life. Uh, I want saints of God that are powerful that will prevent me from being that way. I want to live for God all the days of my life. Amen, amen. And I, I'm going to move quickly here. The Bible says that there was one other, one other individual that Adonijah did not call. When he was going to betray his old dad that was, that was laying over here in the bed. And I'd like for the musicians to go ahead and come. The Bible says that there was one other that Adonijah did not call. And that was Solomon, his brother. Everyone say his brother. Everyone say his brother. He didn't. Look at your neighbor and tell him he didn't call his brother. Now, I'm going to tell you, our prayer needs to be, God, help me to stay close to my brothers and sisters. I know I said it already, but we need one another. We need the church. Amen. You're not going to make it on your own. It's dangerous to get isolated. You get weird thoughts. You start thinking hoof clops and... It must be a zebra. Anybody else would say, that's a horse. But you're all by yourself in a cave, and you get weird thoughts. I, I, heard, about, I heard about a guy by the name of Joshua Slocum. He was the first person in 1895 to circumnavigate the globe in a sailboat by himself. 
Went all the way around the globe in a sailboat by himself. But he began to have hallucinations. He said, he said he was lost and and all of a sudden, Christopher Columbus showed up in his boat. And, uh, and no, 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 it wasn't Christopher Columbus. It was his pilot from the ship Pinta. And that pilot kind of steered his boat through the heavy weather as he lay there sick with food poisoning and got him to land. I'm going to tell you, you get weird when you're all by yourself. Brothers and sisters, you start imagining things that have no basis in fact I want to, hey, I need my brother. I need, I need you to keep me normal. Hallelujah. I, and you don't even have to be normal to keep me normal. We can both be a little bit weird, but, but together we can kind of, God can help us. I'm telling you, we need one another. When you're by yourself, the devil can pick you off like that. I heard about zebras and, and part of their defense mechanisms. We all know that zebras have stripes and, uh, and one of their main predators is the lion and or the whatever the lioness and they they talk about how that these zebras when they're in a herd i kind of got zebras on the brain don't i what does that say about me <laughs> anyway they say that when zebras are in a herd I, I guess you'd call it a herd of zebras there's probably a technical term for it a stripe of zebras or something anyway that when they're all together that lions cannot distinguish one zebra from another. They're just a big mass of zebraness. I think the devil out here tonight, he's kind of trying to pick you out, but it's like, and all I can see is the church. I don't, can't even see Brother Watts. I just see the church. I, I don't see Brother Terry. I just see a big mass of blood washed child of God. I don't see Sister Rhonda Lee. I just see in the Lighthouse Church. Hey, you're safe in the church. But I'll tell you this, you get that zebra off all by itself, that lion know what, knows what to do with it. I'm preaching to somebody tonight, it's time to get back in the middle of the herd. We need our brothers. We need our brothers. I'd like us to stand. I'm almost done. I, if you know the Bible story here, you know that, that while Adonijah did not call Solomon, he did call all of the other king's sons. So, he did call some other brothers. But the question is, why didn't he call Solomon? Why didn't he call Solomon? Well, I'm sure it's because Solomon didn't agree with him, right? Adonijah says, I want to be king. And Solomon had probably been told by his dad or his mom, you're supposed to be the king or God himself. We know that Adonijah knew if I talk to Solomon and bring him in here, he ain't going to be for this. Maybe it was just because he knew down in his heart, Solomon is the one who is really anointed of God to be king. And he said, so I'm not going to put you in the group. I don't want you here. I want to have free reign to let my base nature run. And in so doing, Adonijah placed himself at odds with the will of God. He now was warring against his own brother simply because he wanted to be king instead of his brother. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, we need to surround ourselves with the right people. I believe that that base part of me, I can, I can minimize the chances of it running amok. I can, I can keep at bay that ambitious side of me that, that wants to push others down so I can emerge. And I can do that by putting the right people in my life. And I'm talking to people tonight. It matters, oh, it matters who you surround yourselves with. Is there anybody that says, I want anointed people around me? I'm going to tell you, I'm 46 years old. I've never been more hungry to have anointed peers. I want young men that get in this pulpit that preach with power and anointing. I want them to be more gifted, more anointed. In fact, I want to do everything in my power to promote that. I want to help that. I want to finance that. I want to find them and bless them. And I believe if we can do that in this church, that that anointing can prevent us from failing. I'm not looking for weak people so that I can feel stronger than them. Now, you know, don't, don't take that out of context. 
I want everybody, I don't care how weak, but I'm talking about surrounding myself by weak, unfaithful people with lack of integrity. I don't want that. I want, and I believe I'm talking to a bunch of people that want mighty men of God, mighty women of God. I want to be surrounded by people of character. Hey, I'm looking for people that are more faithful than me, that pray more than us, that read my Bible more, that will encourage me, that will, oh, hallelujah. I'm looking for people that are mighty for God. And is there anybody in this place that wants your brothers and your sisters? I want my Solomons. I need one another. Hey, I need you. I don't want to fight against what God's doing in my brother and sister's life. I'll just tell you this, and I'm almost done. I I don't want to be... I don't want to be the one that pulls others down. I, I, I don't want by my life to allow things into my family and the church. I don't want to be the weak link in my life, in, 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 in the world that I'm in. Somebody just sent me a story yesterday, because it was the 4th of July, about a guy by the name of Abraham Clark. I must confess, <clears throat> I Googled it and I couldn't find it, but so I'm going to tell it to you as I heard it. And I really hope it's true. This, he was, one of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence. This is the part I I haven't confirmed yet. If you find it, come and tell me soon. If you don't, can you wait a couple weeks to tell me? So apparently, this guy, Abraham Clark, had two sons that were officers in the Continental Army. This is during during the, the Revolutionary War, the War for Independence. And uh, his two sons were captured by the British. They were, they were tortured. They were beaten. And, and his sons would not recant. They just, they just said, this is who we are. But then the British came to Abraham Clark, the way I heard the story, and, and offered him the lives of his sons because if he would just recant his signing and support of the Declaration of Independence, he was such an important figure. And they wanted to see him recant that. It is said that after hearing of what had happened to his two sons, that he broke down in tears thinking about his boys. But his boys that had bore the torture and bore the beating, and he thought about all this. And he's sitting there in silence, and finally with tears running down his face, he spoke these words, and he said, no. And his words are, he said, I refuse to be the weakest link in my family. I'm not going to recant my commitment to freedom. Now, I hope that's a true story, but brothers and sisters, that's a beautiful principle. I, I, I refuse to be the weakest link in my family. I refuse to be the weak link in my group. I refuse to allow my base nature to affect those around me. I refuse to be the weak link in my church and here's how we fix it because we all have brokenness and I we all have a tendency to betrayal everybody here I hate to tell you we could all be a Judas if we let ourselves but I'm going to tell you there are some solutions to this don't do like Judas don't get up from the table don't run out the door don't leave his presence and don't leave the presence of the people of God surround yourself by the right people the kind of people you don't want present when you betray the king that'll keep you from betrayal I'm here to tell you tonight that I want anointed people mighty people I want my brothers and sisters around me God keep them around my life and if that's how you feel if that's how you feel tonight then I'm going to open this altar tonight for every man woman and child that would like to come to this altar and pray and I want you to come and lift your hands and lift your voice and begin to talk to the Lord and say God I want you to put the people in my life you want me to have I want to be surrounded by anointing God put the faithful put the mighty put people of integrity God I want righteous people I want gifted people I want seers I want the prophetic surround me Lord I don't want to betray you 
Oh, that's beautiful when you come. Let's just lift our hands. I'm here to tell you, God can put the right people in your world. God, give me the Zadoks and the Nathans. God, give me the Benias. Give me the mighty men. Oh, if that's how you pray, you feel, why don't you lift your voice and pray? Oh, God, let my brothers and sisters surround me, Lord. Surround me, Lord. Strong people, people of integrity. Come on, I'm not going to isolate myself.